Italian Americans, Italian, Italo Americani or Italo Americani, Italo Americani are an ethnic group consisting of Americans who have ancestry from Italy. Italian Americans are the seventh largest census reported ethnic group in the United States, which includes American ethnicity, an ethnonym used by many in the United States. Overall, Italian Americans rank seventh, behind German American, African American, Irish American, Mexican American, English American, and American. About 5.5 million Italians immigrated to the United States from 1820 to 2004. By 1870, there were less than 25,000 Italian immigrants in America, many of them northern Italian refugees from the wars that accompanied the Risorgimento—the struggle for Italian unification and independence from foreign rule. Immigration began to increase during the 1870s, when more than twice as many Italians immigrated 1870-79 to 46,296 than during the five previous decades combined 1820-69 to 22,627. The 1870s were followed by the greatest surge of immigration, which occurred between 1880 and 1914 and brought more than 4 million Italians to the United States, the great majority being from southern Italy and Sicily, with most having agrarian backgrounds. This period of large-scale immigration ended abruptly with the onset of the First World War in 1914 and, except for one year 1922, never fully resumed. Further immigration was greatly limited by several laws Congress passed in the 1920s. Approximately 84% of the Italian immigrants came from the former Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. This was the poorest and least developed part of Italy, still largely rural and agricultural, where much of the populace had been impoverished by centuries of foreign misrule, and an oppressive taxation system imposed after Italian unification in 1861. After unification, the Italian government initially encouraged emigration to relieve economic pressures in the South. After the American Civil War, which resulted in over a half million killed or wounded, immigrant workers were recruited from Italy and elsewhere to fill the labor shortage caused by the war. In the United States, most Italians began their new lives as manual laborers in eastern cities, mining camps and in agriculture. The descendants of the Italian immigrants gradually rose from a lower economic class in the first generation to a level comparable to the national average by 1970. The Italian community has often been characterized by strong ties to family, the Roman Catholic Church, fraternal organizations, and political parties. History Early period 1492 Italian navigators and explorers played a key role in the exploration and settlement of the Americas by Europeans. Christopher Columbus, the explorer who first reached the Americas in 1492–1504, was Italian. Another notable Italian explorer, Amerigo Vespucci, who explored the east coast of South America between 1499 and 1502, is the source of the name America. England's claims in North America were based on the voyages of the Italian explorer John Cabot Giovanni Cabotto and his son Sebastian Cabot Sebastiano Cabotto in the early 16th century. In 1524 the Italian explorer Giovanni da Verrazzano was the first European to map the Atlantic coast of today's United States, and to enter New York Bay. A number of Italian navigators and explorers in the employ of Spain and France were involved in exploring and mapping their territories, and in establishing settlements, but this did not lead to the permanent presence of Italians in America. In 1539, Marco da Nizza, explored the territory that later became the states of Arizona and New Mexico. The first Italian to reside in America was Pietro Cesare Alberti, a Venetian seaman who, in 1635, settled in what would eventually become New York City. A small wave of Protestants, known as Waldensians, who were of French and Northern Italian heritage specifically Piedmontese, occurred during the 17th century. The first Waldensians began arriving around 1640, with the majority coming between 1654 and 1663. They spread out across what was then called New Netherland, and what would become New York, New Jersey and the lower Delaware River regions. 
The total American Waldensian population that immigrated to New Netherland is currently unknown, however, a 1671 Dutch record indicates that, in 1656 alone, the Duchy of Savoy near Turin, Italy, had exiled 300 Waldensians due to their Protestant faith. Henri de Tonti, Enrico de Tonti, together with the French explorer La Salle, explored the Great Lakes region. De Tonti founded the first European settlement in Illinois in 1679, and in Arkansas in 1683. With La Salle, he co-founded New Orleans, and was governor of the Louisiana Territory for the next 20 years. His brother Alphonse de Tonti, Alfonso de Tonti with French explorer Antoine Cadillac, was the co-founder of Detroit in 1701, and was its acting colonial governor for 12 years. Spain and France were Catholic countries and sent many missionaries to convert the native population. Included among these missionaries were numerous Italians. In 1519-25, Alessandro Geraldini was the first Catholic bishop in the Americas, at Santo Domingo. Father François Joseph Bressani, Francesco Giuseppe Bressani labored among the Algonquin and Huron Indians in the early 17th century. Between 1687 and 1711, the Southwest and California were explored and mapped by an Italian Jesuit priest Eusebio Kino Chino. The Taliaferro family, originally from Venice, was one of the first families to settle in Virginia. Francesco Maria de Reggio, an Italian nobleman who served under the French, came to Louisiana in 1751 where he held the title of Captain General of Louisiana until 1763. Another colonial, merchant Francis Ferrari of Genoa, was naturalized as a citizen of Rhode Island in 1752. He died in 1753 and in his will mentions Genoa, his ownership of three ships, cargo of wine and his wife Mary. Mary Ferrari went on to own one of the oldest coffee houses in America, the Merchant Coffee House of New York on Wall Street at Water Street. Her Merchant Coffee House moved across Wall Street in 1772, retaining the same name and patronage. Today, the descendants of the Alberti, Bertus, Taliaferro, Fonda, Reggio and other early families are found all across the United States. Topic war of Independence to Civil War 1775 This period saw a small stream of new arrivals from Italy. Some brought skills in agriculture and the making of glass, silk and wine, while others brought skills as musicians. In 1773–85 Filippo Mazze, a physician and promoter of liberty, was a close friend and confidant of Thomas Jefferson. He published a pamphlet containing the phrase, All men are by nature equally free and independent, which Jefferson incorporated essentially intact into the Declaration of Independence. Italian Americans served in the American Revolutionary War both as soldiers and officers. Three regiments, totaling some 1,500 men, fought for American independence. Francesco Vigo aided the colonial forces of George Rogers Clark during the American Revolutionary War, by being one of the foremost financiers of the revolution in the frontier Northwest. Later, he was a co-founder of Vincennes University in Indiana. After American independence numerous political refugees arrived, most notably, Giuseppe Avizana, Alessandro Gavazzi, Silvio Pellico, Federico Confalinieri, and Eleuterio Felice Foresti. Giuseppe Garibaldi resided in the United States in 1850-51. At the invitation of Jefferson, Carlo Bellini became the first Italian to hold a position at an American college, the College of William and Mary, in the years 1779-1803, as a professor of Italian. In 1801 Philip Tregetta established the nation's first conservatory of music in Boston where, in the first half of the century, organist Charles Nolcini and conductor Louis Ostinelli were also active. In 1805 Thomas Jefferson recruited a group of musicians from Sicily to form a military band, later to become the nucleus of the U.S. Marine Band. The musicians included the young Venerando Polizzi who, in 1816, became the first Italian director of the band. The first opera house in the country opened in 1833 in New York through the efforts of Lorenzo da Ponte, Mozart's former librettist, who had immigrated to America and had become the first professor of Italian at Columbia College in 1825. During this period Italian explorers continued to be active in the West. In 1789-91 Alessandro Malaspina mapped much of the west coast of the Americas, from Cape Horn to the Gulf of Alaska. 
In 1822–23 the headwater region of the Mississippi was explored by Giacomo Beltrami in the territory that was later to become Minnesota, which named a county in his honor. Joseph Rosati was named the first Catholic Bishop of St. Louis in 1824. In 1830–64 Samuel Mazzuchelli, a missionary and expert in Indian languages, ministered to European colonists and Native Americans in Wisconsin and Iowa for 34 years and, after his death, was declared venerable by the Catholic Church. Father Charles Constantine Peace, a Jesuit, served as chaplain of the Senate from 1832 to 1833, the only Catholic priest ever chosen to serve in this capacity. Missionaries of the Jesuit and Franciscan orders were active in many parts of America. Italian Jesuits founded numerous missions, schools and two colleges in the West. Giovanni Nobili founded the Santa Clara College now Santa Clara University in 1851. The St. Ignatius Academy now University of San Francisco was established by Anthony Marisci in 1855. The Italian Jesuits also laid the foundation for the wine-making industry that would later flourish in California. In the East, the Italian Franciscans founded hospitals, orphanages, schools, and the St. Bonaventure College now St. Bonaventure University, established by Panfilo da Magliano in 1858. In 1837 John Finizzi became the mayor of Augusta, Georgia. Samuel Wilde's Trotty of South Carolina was the first Italian-American to serve in the U.S. Congress a partial term, from December 17, 1842 to March 3, 1843. In 1849 Francesco, de Casali began publishing the Italian-American newspaper, Laco d'Italia, in New York, the first of many to eventually follow. In 1848 Francis Ramachotti, piano string inventor and manufacturer, immigrated to the U.S. from Tuscany. Topic: Civil War and After 1861 to 90. Approximately 7,000 Italian Americans served in the Civil War, both as soldiers and as officers. While some served in the Confederate Army, including General William B. Taliaferro, the majority, for both demographic and ideological reasons, served in the Union Army, including Generals Edward Ferrero and Francis B. Spinola. The Garibaldi Guard recruited volunteers for the Union Army from Italy and other European countries to form the 39th New York Infantry. Six Italian Americans received the Medal of Honor during the war, among whom was Colonel Luigi Palma di Cesnola, who later became the first director of the Metropolitan Museum of Arts in New York. 1879 Beginning in 1863, Italian immigrants were one of the principal groups, along with the Irish, that built the Transcontinental Railroad west from Omaha, Nebraska. In 1866, Constantino Brumidi completed the frescoed interior of the United States Capitol Dome in Washington, and spent the rest of his life executing still other artworks to beautify the Capitol. The first Columbus Day celebration was organized by Italian Americans in San Francisco in 1869. An immigrant, Antonio Miucci, brought with him a concept for the telephone. He is credited by many researchers with being the first to demonstrate the principle of the telephone in a patent caveat he submitted to the U.S. Patent Office in 1871. However, considerable controversy existed relative to the priority of invention, with Alexander Graham Bell also being accorded this distinction. In 2002, the U.S. Congress passed a resolution (H.R. 269) declaring Antonio Miucci the true inventor of the telephone. During this period, Italian Americans established a number of institutions of higher learning. Las Vegas College now Regis University was established by a group of exiled Italian Jesuits in 1877 in Las Vegas, New Mexico. The Jesuit Giuseppe Cataldo, founded Gonzaga College now Gonzaga University in Spokane, Washington in 1887. In 1886, Rabbi Sabato Morais, a Jewish Italian immigrant, was one of the founders and first president of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America in New York. Also during this period, there was a growing presence of Italian Americans in higher education. Vincenzo Bada was a distinguished professor of Italian at New York University from 1856 to 1894, and Gaetano Lanza was a professor of mechanical engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology for over 40 years. Beginning in 1871, Italian Americans continued their involvement in politics. Anthony Gio became the mayor of Texarkana, Texas in 1880. 
Francis B. Spinola, the first Italian-American to serve a full term in Congress, was elected in 1887 from New York. The period of mass immigration 1890 Italian unification in 1861 caused economic conditions to considerably worsen for many in the former Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. Major factors that contributed to the large exodus from southern Italy and Sicily after unification, included, political and social unrest, the government's allocation of much more of its resources to the industrialization of the North than to that of the South, an inequitable tax burden on the South, tariffs on the products of the South, soil exhaustion and erosion, and military conscription lasting seven years. The poor economic situation following unification became untenable for many sharecroppers, tenant farmers, and small business and land owners. Multitudes chose to emigrate rather than face the prospect of a deepening poverty. A large number of these were attracted to the U.S. which, at the time, was actively recruiting workers from Italy and elsewhere to fill the labor shortage that existed in the years following the Civil War. Often, the father and older sons would go first, leaving the mother and the rest of the family behind until the male members could afford their passage. From 1880 to 1915, an estimated 13 million Italians migrated out of Italy, making Italy the scene of the largest voluntary emigration in recorded world history. During this period of mass migration, 4 million Italian immigrants arrived in the United States, and 3 million of the Italian immigrants came just between 1900 and 1915. Once in America, the immigrants faced great challenges. Often with no knowledge of the English language and with little formal education, many of the immigrants were compelled to accept low-wage manual labor jobs, and were frequently exploited by the middlemen who acted as intermediaries between them and the prospective employers. Many sought housing in the older sections of the large northeastern cities where they settled, that became known as Little Italy's. Frequently in overcrowded substandard tenements which were often dimly lit with poor heating and ventilation. Tuberculosis and other communicable diseases were a constant health threat for the immigrant families that were compelled by economic circumstances to live in these dwellings. Other immigrant families lived in single-family abodes, which was more typical in areas outside of the enclaves of the large northeastern cities, and other parts of the country as well. An estimated 49% of Italians who migrated to the Americas between 1905 when return migration statistics began and 1920 did not remain in the United States. These so-called birds of passage intended to stay in the United States for only a limited time, followed by a return to Italy with enough in savings to re-establish themselves there. While many did return to Italy, others chose to stay, or were prevented from returning by the outbreak of World War I. The Italian male immigrants in the Little Italies were most often employed in manual labor and were heavily involved in public works, such as the construction of roads, railway tracks, sewers, subways, bridges and the first skyscrapers in the northeastern cities. As early as 1890, 90% of New York City's public works employees were Italian. The women most frequently worked as seamstresses in the garment industry or in their homes. Many established small businesses in the Little Italies to satisfy the day-to-day -day needs of fellow immigrants. A New York Times article from 1895 provides a glimpse into the status of Italian immigration at the turn of the century. The article states, Of the half million Italians that are in the United States, about 100,000 live in the city, and including those who live in Brooklyn, Jersey City, and the other suburbs the total number in the vicinity is estimated at about 160,000. After learning our ways they become good, industrious citizens. The New York Times in May 1896 sent its reporters to characterize the Little Italy, Mulberry neighborhood. They are laborers, toilers in all grades of manual work, they are artisans, they are junkmen, and here, too, dwell the rag pickers. There is a monster colony of Italians who might be termed the commercial or shop-keeping community of the Latins. Here are all sorts of stores, pensions, groceries, fruit emporiums, tailors, shoemakers, wine merchants, importers, musical instrument makers. There are notaries, lawyers, doctors, apothecaries, undertakers. There are more bankers among the Italians than among any other foreigners except the Germans in the city. The masses of Italian immigrants that entered the United States 1890 to 1900 posed a change in the labor market, prompting FR 
Michael J. Henry to write a letter in October 1900 to the Bishop John J. Clancy of Sligo, Ireland, warning that unskilled young Irishmen would have to enter into competition with their pickaxe and shovel against other nationalities, Italians, Poles etc. to eke out bare existence. The Italians are more economic, can live on poor fare and consequently can afford to work for less wages than the ordinary Irishman. Brooklyn Eagle in a 1900 article addressed the same reality. The day of the Irish hod carrier has long been past. But it is the Italian now that does the work. Then came the Italian carpenter and finally the mason and the bricklayer in spite of the economic hardship of the immigrants, civil and social life flourished in the Italian-American neighborhoods of the large northeastern cities. Italian theater, band concerts, choral recitals, puppet shows, mutual aid societies, and social clubs were available to the immigrants. An important event, the Festa, became for many an important connection to the traditions of their ancestral villages in Italy. The festa involved an elaborate procession through the streets in honor of a patron saint or the Virgin Mary in which a large statue was carried by a team of men, with musicians marching behind. Followed by food, fireworks and general merriment, the festa became an important occasion that helped give the immigrants a sense of unity and common identity. An American teacher who had studied in Italy, Sarah Woolmore was so concerned with grifters luring immigrants into rooming houses or employment contracts in which the bosses got kickbacks that she pressed for the founding of the Society for the Protection of Italian Immigrants often called the Society for Italian Immigrants. The Society published lists of approved living quarters and employers. Later, the organization began establishing schools in work camps to help adult immigrants learn English. Wool and the Society began organizing schools in the labor camps which employed Italian workers on various dam and quarry projects in Pennsylvania and New York. The schools focused on teaching phrases that workers needed in their everyday tasks. Because of the Society's success in helping immigrants, they received a commendation from the Commissioner of Emigration for the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1907, to assist the immigrants in the Little Italies, who were overwhelmingly Catholic. Pope Leo XIII dispatched a contingent of priests, nuns and brothers of the missionaries of St. Charles Borromeo. Among these was Sister Francesca Cabrini, who founded schools, hospitals and orphanages. She was canonized as the first American saint in 1946. Hundreds of parishes were founded by the St. Charles missionaries to serve the needs of the Italian communities. By 1910, Italians had founded 219 Italian Catholic churches and 41 parochial schools, served by 315 priests and 254 nuns, two Catholic seminaries and three orphanages. The destinations of many of the Italian immigrants were not only the large cities of the East Coast, but also more remote regions of the country, such as Florida and California. They were drawn there by opportunities in agriculture, fishing, mining, railroad construction, lumbering and other activities underway at the time. Oftentimes, the immigrants contracted to work in these areas of the country as a condition for payment of their passage. It was not uncommon, especially in the South, for the immigrants to be subjected to economic exploitation, hostility and sometimes even violence. The Italian laborers who went to these areas were in many cases later joined by wives and children, which resulted in the establishment of permanent Italian-American settlements in diverse parts of the country. A number of towns, such as Rosetto, Pennsylvania, Tontatown, Arkansas, and Valdez, North Carolina were founded by Italian immigrants during this era. A number of major business ventures were founded by Italian-Americans. Amadio Giannini originated the concept of branch banking to serve the Italian-American community in San Francisco. He founded the Bank of Italy, which later became the Bank of America. His bank also provided financing to the film industry developing on the West Coast at the time. Other companies founded by Italian-Americans, such as Ghirardelli Chocolate Company, Progresso, Planters Peanuts, Contadina, Chef Boyardi, Italian Swiss Colony Wines and Jacuzzi, became nationally known brand names in time. An Italian immigrant, Italo Marcioni, Marcioni is credited with inventing the earliest version of an ice cream cone in 1898. Another Italian immigrant, Giuseppe Balanca, brought with him in 1912 an advanced aircraft design, which he began producing. It was Charles Lindbergh's first choice for his flight across the Atlantic, but other factors ruled this out. However, one of Balanca's planes, piloted by Cesare Sabelli and George Pond, made one of the first non-stop transatlantic flights in 1934. 
A number of Italian immigrant families, including Grucci, Zambelli and Vitali, brought with them expertise in fireworks displays, and their pre-eminence in this field has continued to the present day. Following in the footsteps of Constantino Brumidi, other Italians and their descendants helped create Washington's impressive monuments. An Italian immigrant, Attilio Piccarilli, and his five brothers carved the Lincoln Memorial, which they began in 1911 and completed in 1922. Italian construction workers helped build Washington's Union Station, considered one of the most beautiful in the country, which was begun in 1905 and completed in 1908. The six statues that decorate the station's façade were sculpted by Andrew Bernasconi between 1909 and 1911. Two Italian-American master stone carvers, Roger Morigi and Vincent Palumbo, spent decades creating the sculptural works that embellish Washington National Cathedral. Italian conductors contributed to the early success of the Metropolitan Opera of New York, founded in 1880, but it was the arrival of impresario Giulio Gatti Casazza in 1908, who brought with him conductor Arturo Toscanini, that made the Met an internationally known musical organization. Many Italian operatic singers and conductors were invited to perform for American audiences, most notably, tenor Enrico Caruso. The premiere of the opera La Finchula del West on December 10, 1910, with conductor Toscanini and tenor Caruso, and with the composer Giacomo Puccini in attendance, was a major international success as well as an historic event for the entire Italian American community. Italian Americans became involved in entertainment and sports. Rudolph Valentino was one of the first great film icons. Dixieland jazz music had a number of important Italian-American innovators, the most famous being Nick LaRocca of New Orleans, whose quintet made the first jazz recording in 1917. The first Italian-American professional baseball player, Ping Bodhi, Francesco Pizzoli, began playing for the Chicago White Sox in 1912. Ralph De Palma won the Indianapolis 500 in 1915. Italian Americans became increasingly involved in politics, government and the labor movement. Andrew Longino was elected governor of Mississippi in 1900. Charles Bonaparte was Secretary of the Navy and later Attorney General in the Theodore Roosevelt administration, and founded the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Salvatore A. Cotillo was the first Italian American to serve in both houses of the New York State Legislature and the first who served as Justice of the New York State Supreme Court. Fiorello LaGuardia was elected from New York in 1916 to serve in the U.S. Congress. Numerous Italian Americans were at the forefront in fighting for workers' rights in industries such as the mining, textiles and garment industries, the most notable among these being Arturo Giovanniti, Carlo Tresca and Joseph Eder. Topic: 1917-1941. The United States entered World War I in 1917. The Italian-American community wholeheartedly supported the war effort and its young men, both American-born and Italian-born, enlisted in large numbers in the American Army. It was estimated that, during the two years of the war 1917-18, Italian-American servicemen made up approximately 12% of the total American forces, a disproportionately high percentage of the total. An Italian-born American infantryman, Michael Valente, was awarded the Medal of Honor for his service. Another 103 Italian-Americans Italian were awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, the second highest decoration, the war, together with the Restrictive Emergency Quota Act of 1921, Immigration Act of 1924 and the implementation of the discriminatory national origins formula heavily curtailed Italian immigration. The quota allocated for Italians was one thirteenth of that allocated for Germans and, in general, Anglo-Saxon and Northern European immigration was heavily favored. Despite implementation of the quota, the inflow of Italian immigrants remained between 6 or 7 percent of all immigrants. By 1920, the Little Italys had stabilized and grown considerably more prosperous as workers were able to obtain higher paying jobs, often in skilled trades. English was now the language most commonly heard on the streets of the Little Italys. In the post war years, jobs as policemen, firemen, and civil servants became available to Italian Americans, while others found employment as plumbers, electricians, mechanics, and carpenters. Women found jobs as civil servants, secretaries, dressmakers, and clerks. With better paying jobs, they moved to more affluent neighborhoods outside of the Italian enclaves. 
The Great Depression had a major impact on the Italian-American community, and temporarily reversed some of the earlier gains made. Many unemployed men and a few women found jobs on President Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal work programs, such as the Works Progress Administration and the Civilian Conservation Corp. In the 1920s and 1930s Italian Americans contributed significantly to American life and culture via, politics, music, film, the arts, sports, the labor movement and business. In politics, Al Smith Ferrara was the first governor of New York of Italian ancestry although the media characterized him as an Irish Catholic. He was the first Catholic to receive a major party presidential nomination, as Democratic candidate for president in 1928. He lost Protestant strongholds in the South, but energized the Democratic vote in immigrant centers across the entire North. Angelo Rossi was mayor of San Francisco in 1931-44. In 1933-34 Ferdinand Pecora led a Senate investigation of the Wall Street Crash of 1929, which exposed major financial abuses, and spurred Congress to reign in the banking industry. Liberal leader Fiorello LaGuardia served as Republican and Fusion Mayor of New York City in 1934-45. On the far left Vito Marcantonio was first elected to Congress in 1934 from New York. Robert Maestri was mayor of New Orleans in 1936-46. The Metropolitan Opera continued to flourish under the leadership of Giulio Gatti Casazza, whose tenure continued until 1935. Rosa Ponzel and Dusselina Giannini, daughters of Italian immigrants, performed regularly at the Metropolitan Opera and became internationally known. Arturo Toscanini returned in the United States as the main conductor of the New York Philharmonic Orchestra 1926 and introduced many Americans to classical music through his NBC Symphony Orchestra radio broadcasts 1937 Ruggiero Ricci, a child prodigy born of Italian immigrant parents, gave his first public performance in 1928 at the age of 10, and had a long international career as a concert violinist. Popular singers of the period included Russ Colombo, who established a new singing style that influenced Frank Sinatra and other singers that followed. On Broadway, Harry Warren Salvatore Guaragna wrote the music for 42nd Street, and received three Academy Awards for his compositions. Other Italian-American musicians and performers, such as Jimmy Durante, who later achieved fame in movies and television, were active in vaudeville. Guy Lombardo formed a popular dance band, which played annually on New Year's Eve in New York City's Times Square. The film industry of this era included Frank Capra, who received three Academy Awards for directing. Italian-American cartoonists were responsible for some of the most popular animated characters. Donald Duck was created by Al Taliaferro, Woody Woodpecker was a creation of Walter Lance Lanza, Casper the Friendly Ghost was co-created by Joseph Oriolo, and Tom and Jerry was co-created by Joseph Barbera. The voice of Snow White was provided by Adriana Casalotti, a 21-year-old soprano. In public art, Luigi Del Bianco was the chief stone carver at Mount Rushmore from 1933 to 1940. Simon Rodia, an immigrant construction worker, built the Watts Towers over a period of 33 years, from 1921 to 1954. In sports, Jean Sarazin Eugenio won both the Professional Golf Association and U.S. Open tournaments in 1922. Pete DiPaolo won the Indianapolis 500 in 1925. Tony Lazzari and Frank Crisetti started playing for the New York Yankees in 1926. Tony Canzoneri won the lightweight boxing championship in 1930. Lou Little Luigi Piccolo began coaching the Columbia University football team in 1930. Joe DiMaggio, who was destined to become one of the most famous players in baseball history, began playing for the New York Yankees in 1936. Hank Luzetti was a three-time All-American basketball player at Stanford University from 1936 to 1940. Louis Zamperini, the American distance runner, competed in the 1936 Olympics, and later became the subject of the best-selling book Unbroken by Laura Hillenbrand, published in 2010, and a 2014 movie of the same title. Italian Americans continued their significant involvement in the labor movement during this period. Well-known labor organizers included Carlo Tresca, Luigi Antonini, James Petrillo, and Angela Bambase. 
Italian American businessmen specialized in growing and selling fresh fruits and vegetables, which were cultivated on small tracts of land in the suburban parts of many cities. They cultivated the land and raised produce, which was trucked into the nearby cities and often sold directly to the consumer through farmers' markets. In California, the DiGiorgio Corporation was founded, which grew to become a national supplier of fresh produce in the United States. Italian Americans in California were leading growers of grapes, and producers of wine. Many well-known wine brands, such as Mondavi, Carlo Rossi, Petri, Sebastiani, and Gallo emerged from these early enterprises. Italian American companies were major importers of Italian wines, processed foods, textiles, marble and manufactured goods. World War II As a member of the Axis powers, Italy declared war on the United States in December 1941. Over 1.5 million Italian Americans served in the armed forces during World War II, amounting to some 10% of American soldiers in total. Some Italians were outspoken admirers of Mussolini, while others had never taken out American citizenship. Those viewed as a potential threat to the country were interned in detention camps, some for up to two years. As many as 600,000 others, who had not become citizens, were required to carry identity cards identifying them as resident alien. Thousands more on the West Coast were required to move inland, often losing their homes and businesses in the process. A number of Italian language newspapers were forced to close because of their past support of fascist dictator Benito Mussolini. Two books, Una Storia Segreta by Lawrence D. Stasi and Uncivil Liberties by Stephen Fox, and a movie, Prisoners Among Us, document these World War II developments. Italian Americans served with distinction during the war, and 14 were awarded the Medal of Honor. Among these was S.G.T. John Bassalone, one of the most decorated and famous servicemen in World War II, who was later featured in the HBO series The Pacific. Army Ranger Colonel Henry Mucci led one of the most successful rescue missions in U.S. history, that freed 511 survivors of the Bataan Death March from a Japanese prison camp in the Philippines, in 1945. In the air, Capt. Don Gentile became one of the war's leading aces, with 25 German planes destroyed. The work of Enrico Fermi was crucial in developing the atom bomb. Fermi, a Nobel Prize laureate nuclear physicist, who immigrated to the United States from Italy in 1938, led a research team at the University of Chicago that achieved the world's first sustained nuclear chain reaction, which clearly demonstrated the feasibility of an atom bomb. Fermi later became a key member of the team at Los Alamos Laboratory that developed the first atom bomb. He was subsequently joined at Los Alamos by Emilio Segre, one of his colleagues from Italy, who was also destined to receive the Nobel Prize in Physics. Three United States World War II destroyers were named after Italian Americans. USS Bassalone DD-824 was named for SGT. John Bassalone, USS D'Amato DD-871 was named for Corporal Anthony P. D'Amato, who was awarded the Medal of Honor posthumously for his valor during World War II, and USS Gerardi DD-637 was named for Rear Admiral Bancroft Gerardi, who served during the Mexican-American and U.S. Civil Wars. World War II ended the unemployment and relief that characterized the 1930s, opening up new employment opportunities for large numbers of Italian Americans. Much of the Italian American population was concentrated in urban areas where the new munitions plants were located. Many Italian American women took war jobs, such as Rose Bonavita, who was recognized by President Roosevelt with a personal letter commending her for her performance as an aircraft riveter. She, together with a number of other women workers, provided the basis of the name, Rosie the Riveter which came to symbolize all of the millions of American women workers in the war industries. Chef Boyardi, the company founded by Edda Ray Boyardi, was one of the largest suppliers of rations for U.S. and Allied forces during World War II. For his contribution to the war effort, Boyardi was awarded a Gold Star Order of Excellence from the United States War Department. Director Frank Capra made a series of wartime documentaries known as Why We Fight, for which he received the U.S. Distinguished Service Medal in 1945, and the Order of the British Empire Medal in 1962. <laughs> <laughs> wartime violation of Italian-American civil liberties 
From the onset of the war, and particularly following Pearl Harbor many viewed Italian Americans with suspicion. Groups such as the Los Angeles Council of California Women's Clubs petitioned General DeWitt to place all enemy aliens in concentration camps immediately, and the Young Democratic Club of Los Angeles went a step further, demanding the removal of American-born Italians and Germans—U.S. citizens—from the Pacific coast. These calls along with substantial political pressure from Congress resulted in President Franklin D. Roosevelt issuing Executive Order No. 9066, as well as the Department of Justice classifying unnaturalized Italian Americans as enemy aliens under the Alien and Sedition Act. Thousands of Italians were arrested, and hundreds of Italians were interned in military camps, some for up to two years. As many as 600,000 others were required to carry identity cards identifying them as resident alien. Thousands more on the West Coast were required to move inland, often losing their homes and businesses in the process. A number of Italian language newspapers were forced to close. Two books, Una Storia Segreta by Lawrence D. Stasi and Uncivil Liberties by Stephen Fox, and a movie, Prisoners Among Us, document these World War II developments. On November 7, 2000 Bill Clinton signed the Wartime Violation of Italian American Civil Liberties Act. This act ordered a comprehensive review by the Attorney General of the United States of the treatment of Italian Americans during the Second World War. The findings concluded that the freedom of more than 600,000 Italian-born immigrants in the United States and their families was restricted during World War II by government measures that branded them enemy aliens and included carrying identification cards, travel restrictions, and seizure of personal property. During World War II more than 10,000 Italian Americans living on the West Coast were forced to leave their homes and prohibited from entering coastal zones. More than 50,000 were subjected to curfews. During World War II thousands of Italian-American immigrants were arrested, and hundreds were interned in military camps. Hundreds of thousands of Italian-Americans performed exemplary service and thousands sacrificed their lives in defense of the United States. At the time, Italians were the largest foreign-born group in the United States, and today are the fifth largest immigrant group in the United States, numbering approximately 15 million. The impact of the wartime experience was devastating to Italian-American communities in the United States, and its effects are still being felt. A deliberate policy kept these measures from the public during the war. Even 50 years later much information is still classified, the full story remains unknown to the public, and it has never been acknowledged in any official capacity by the United States government. In 2010, California officially issued an apology to the Italian-Americans whose civil liberties had been violated. Post-World War II period Italians continued to immigrate to the United States, and an estimated 600,000 arrived in the decades following the war. Many of the new arrivals had professional training, or were skilled in various trades. The post-war period was a time of great social change for Italian Americans. Many aspired to a college education, which became possible for returning veterans through the Guy Bill. With better job opportunities and better educated, Italian Americans entered mainstream American life in great numbers. The Italian enclaves were largely abandoned by the younger generation, who more often chose to live in other urban areas and in the suburbs. Many married outside of their ethnic group, most frequently with other ethnic Catholics, but increasingly also with those of diverse religious and ethnic backgrounds. Italian Americans took advantage of the new opportunities that generally became available to all in the post-war decades. They made many significant contributions to American life and culture. Numerous Italian Americans became involved in politics at the local, state and national levels in the post-war decades. Those that became U.S. Senators included, John Pastor of Rhode Island, who was the first Italian-American elected to the Senate in 1950, Pete Domenici, who was elected to the U.S. Senate from New Mexico in 1973, and served six terms, Patrick Leahy who was elected to the U.S. Senate from Vermont in 1973, and has served continuously since then, and Alphonse D'Amato, who served as U.S. Senator from New York from 1981 to 1999. Benjamin Civiletti served as the United States Attorney General during the last year and a half of the Carter administration, from 1979 to 1981. 
Scores of Italian Americans became well known singers in the post war period, including Frank Sinatra, Mario Lanza, Perry Como, Dean Martin, Tony Bennett, Frankie Lane, Bobby Darin, Julius La Rosa, and Connie Francis. Italian Americans who hosted popular musical, variety TV shows in the post war decades included Perry Como, Piano Virtuoso Liberace, Jimmy Durante, Frank Sinatra, and Dean Martin. Broadway, musical stars included Carol Lawrence, Anna Maria Alberghetti, Sergio Franchi, Patti Lapone, Ezio Pinza and Liza Minnelli. In music composition, Henry Mancini and Bill Conti received numerous Academy Awards for their songs and film scores. Classical and operatic composers John Carigliano, Norman Dello Gioio, David Del Tradicia, Paul Creston, Dominic Argento, and Giancarlo Minotti were honored with Pulitzer Prizes and Grammy Awards. Numerous Italian Americans became well known in movies, both as actors and directors, and many were Academy Award recipients. Movie directors included Frank Capra, Francis Ford Coppola, Michael Cimino, Vincent Minnelli, and Martin Scorsese. Italian Americans were active in professional sports as players, coaches, and commissioners. Well known professional baseball coaches in the post war decades included Yogi Berra, Billy Martin, Tony La Russa, Tommy Lasorda, and Joe Torre. In professional football, Vince Lombardi set the standard of excellence for all coaches to follow. A. Bartlett Giamatti became president of the National Baseball League in 1986, and commissioner of baseball in 1989. Paul Taliabu was commissioner of the National Football League from 1989 to 2006. In college football, Joe Paterno became one of the most successful coaches ever. Seven Italian-American players won the Heisman Trophy, Angelo Bertelli of Notre Dame, Alan Amici of Wisconsin, Gary Beban of UCLA, Joe Bellino of Navy, John Capelletti of Penn State, Gino Toretta and Vinny Testaverdi of Miami. In college basketball, a number of Italian-Americans became well-known coaches in the post-war decades, including, John Calipari, Lou Carnesecca, Roli Massimino, Rick Pitino, Jim Valvano, Dick Vitale, Tom Izzo, Mike Fratello, Ben Carnevale and Gino Orima. Italian-Americans became nationally known in other diverse sports. Rocky Marciano was the undefeated heavyweight boxing champion from 1952 to 1956. Ken Venturi won both the British and U.S. Open Golf Championships in 1956. Donna Caponi won the U.S. Women's Open Golf Championships in 1969 and 1970. Linda Fratian was the women's U.S. figure skating champion four years in a row, from 1975 to 78, and world champion in 1976 and 1978. Willie Moscone was a 15-time World Billiard Champion, Eddie Arcaro was a five-time Kentucky Derby winner, Mario Andretti was a three-time National Race Car Champion, Mary Lou Retton won the all-around gold medal in Olympic women's gymnastics, Matt Biondi won a total of eight gold medals in Olympic swimming, and Brian Boitano won a gold medal in Olympic men's singles figure skating. Italian Americans founded many successful business enterprises, both small and large, in the post war decades, including Barnes and Noble, Tropicana Products, Zamboni, Transamerica, Subway, Mr. Coffee, and Conair Corporation. Other enterprises founded by Italian Americans were Fairla Dickinson University, the Eternal Word Television Network, and the Syracuse Nationals basketball team, later to become the Philadelphia 76ers. Seven Italian Americans became Nobel Prize laureates in the post war decades Mario Capecchi, Renato Dolbecco, Riccardo Giacconi, Salvatore Luria, Franco Modigliani, Rita Levi Montalcini, and Emilio G. Segre. Italian Americans continued to serve with distinction in the military, with four Medal of Honor recipients in the Korean War and eleven in the Vietnam War, including Vincent Capodanno, a Catholic chaplain. Topic. Close of the 20th century By the close of the 20th century, Italian Americans had achieved education, employment and income parity with Americans in general. They had excelled in all fields of endeavor, and had made substantial contributions in virtually all areas of American life and culture. Italian Americans had served with distinction in all of America's wars, and over 30 had been awarded the Medal of Honor. 
A number of Italian Americans were serving as top ranking generals in the military, including Anthony Zinni, Raymond Odierno, Carl Vuono, and Peter Pace, the latter three having also been appointed Chief of Staff of their respective services. Over two dozen of Italian descent had been elected as state governors, most recently Paul Cellucci of Massachusetts, John Baldacci of Maine, Janet Napolitano of Arizona, Donald Carcieri of Rhode Island, Joseph Manchin of West Virginia, Gina Raimondo of Rhode Island, Chris Christie of New Jersey, and Andrew Cuomo of New York. At the close of the 20th century, 31 men and women of Italian descent were serving in the U.S. House and Senate. Two Italian Americans, Antonin Scalia and Samuel Alito, were serving as U.S. Supreme Court justices. Over two dozen Italian Americans were serving in the Catholic Church as bishops. Four Joseph Bernardin, Justin Rigali, Anthony Bevilacqua, and Daniel DiNardo had been elevated to cardinals. Italian Americans were responsible for major breakthroughs in engineering, medicine, and science. Federico Fagan developed the first microchip and microprocessor, Robert Gallo led research that identified a cancer causing virus, and also the AIDS virus. Anthony Fossi conducted significant research that led to the discovery of the AIDS virus, Riccardo Giacconi developed the X ray telescope, and Enrico Fermi ushered in the nuclear power age. At the close of the 20th century, according to the National Italian American Foundation, 82 of the 1,000 largest U.S. cities had mayors of Italian descent, and 100 166 college and university presidents were of Italian descent. Nine Italian Americans, including a woman, had gone into space as astronauts Wally Shira, Dominic Antonelli, Charles Camarda, Michael Massimino, Richard Mastracchio, Ronald Parisi, Mario Runco, Albert Sacco, and Nicole Marie Pisono Stott. Americans of Italian descent were well known television personalities. Talk show hosts included Jay Leno, Jimmy Kimmel, and Kelly Ripa. Current affairs and financial show hosts included Maria Bartiromo and Neil Cavuto. Italian Americans had changed the eating habits of America. An increasing number of Italian dishes were known and enjoyed. Italian American TV personalities, such as Mario Batali, Giada De Laurentiis, Rachel Ray, and Lydia Bostianich, were hosting popular cooking shows featuring Italian cuisine. Within a century of the period of peak immigration, Italian Americans had achieved prominence in politics, the judiciary, business, the professions, the military, and the Catholic hierarchy. They were counted among the country's best known sports and entertainment figures. Politics In the 1930s, Italian Americans voted heavily Democratic. Carmen de Sapio in the late 1940s became the first to break the Irish Catholic hold on Tammany Hall since the 1870s. By 1951, more than twice as many Italian American legislators as in 1936 served in the six states with the most Italian Americans. Since 1968, voters have split about evenly between the Democratic 37% and the Republican 36% parties. The U.S. Congress includes Italian Americans who are leaders in both the Republican and Democratic parties. In 2007, Nancy Pelosi DCA became the first woman and Italian American Speaker of the United States House of Representatives. Former Republican New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani was a candidate for the U.S. presidency in the 2008 election, as was Colorado Congressman Tom Tancredo. Rick Santorum won many primaries in his candidacy for the 2012 Republican presidential nomination. In the 2016 election, Santorum and New Jersey Governor Chris Christie ran for the Republican nomination, as did Ted Cruz and George Pataki, who both have a smaller amount of Italian ancestry. Geraldine Ferraro was the first woman on a major party ticket, running for vice president as a Democrat in 1984. Two justices of the Supreme Court have been Italian Americans, Antonin Scalia and Samuel Alito, both were appointed by Republican presidents, Scalia by Ronald Reagan and Alito by George W. Bush. The Italian American congressional delegation currently includes 30 members of Congress who are of Italian descent. They are joined by more than 150 associate members, who are not Italian-American but have large Italian-American constituencies. Since its founding in 1975, the National Italian-American Foundation has worked closely with the bicameral and bipartisan Italian-American congressional delegation, which is led by co-chairs Representative Bill Pascrell of New Jersey and Rep. Pat Tiberi of Ohio. 
The NIAF hosts a variety of public policy programs, contributing to public discourse on timely policy issues facing the nation and the world. These events are held on Capitol Hill and other locations under the auspices of NIAF's Frank J. Garini Public Policy Forum and its sister program, the NIAF Public Policy Lecture Series. NIAF's 2009 public policy programs on Capitol Hill featured prominent Italians and Italian Americans as keynote speakers, including Leon Panetta, director of the CIA, and Franco Fertini, Minister of Foreign Affairs for the Republic of Italy. By the 1890s Italian Americans in New York City were mobilizing as a political force. They helped elect Fiorello LaGuardia a Republican as mayor in 1933, and helped re-elect him in 1937, and 1941. They rallied for Vincent R. Impelitari a Democrat in 1950, and Rudolph W. Giuliani a Republican in 1989 when he lost, and in 1993 and 1997 when he won. All three Italian Americans aggressively fought to reduce crime in the city, each was known for his good relations with the city's powerful labor unions. LaGuardia and Giuliani have the reputation among specialists on urban politics as two of the best mayors in American history. Democrat Bill de Blasio, the third mayor of Italian ancestry, is the 109th and current mayor of New York City. Mario Cuomo Democratic served as the 52nd governor of New York for three terms, from 1983 to 1995. His son Andrew Cuomo is the 56th and current governor of New York and previously served as Secretary of Housing and Urban Development from 1997 to 2001, and as the Attorney General of New York from 2007 to 2010. <laughs> <laughs> Business and economy Italian Americans have played a prominent role in the economy of the United States, and have founded companies of great national importance, such as Bank of America by Amadio Giannini in 1904, and many companies that have contributed to the local culture and character of U.S. cities, such as Petrini's Markets founded by Frank Petrini in 1935, among many others. Italian Americans have also made important contributions to the growth of the U.S. economy through their business expertise. Italian Americans have served as CEOs of numerous major corporations, such as the Ford Motor Company and Chrysler Corporation by Lee Iacocca, IBM Corporation by Samuel Palmisano, Lucent Technologies by Patricia Russo, the New York Stock Exchange by Richard Grasso, Honeywell Incorporated by Michael Bonsignori, and Intel by Paul Odellini. Workers. <laughs> 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 About two-thirds of America's Italian immigrants arrived during 1900-24. Having little formal education and industrial skills, approximately 80% became unskilled laborers heavily concentrated in the cities. The remaining 20% came with traditional Italian skills as, tailors, barbers, bricklayers, stonemasons, stonecutters, marble, tile and terrazzo workers, fishermen, musicians, singers, shoe makers, shoe repairers, cooks, bakers, carpenters, grape growers, wine makers, silk makers, dressmakers, and seamstresses. Others came to provide for the needs of the immigrant communities, notably doctors, dentists, midwives, lawyers, teachers, morticians, priests, nuns, and brothers. Many of the skilled workers found work in their speciality, first in the Italian enclaves, and eventually in the broader society. Traditional skills were often passed down from father to son, and from mother to daughter. By the second generation approximately 70% of the men had blue-collar jobs, and the proportion was down to approximately 50% in the third generation, according to surveys in 1963. By 1987, the level of Italian-American income exceeded the national average, and since the 1950s it grew faster than any other white ethnic group except the Jews. By 1990, according to the U.S. Census, more than 65% of Italian Americans were employed as managerial, professional, or white-collar workers. In 1999, the median annual income of Italian American families was $61,300, while the median annual income of all American families was $50,000. <laughs> == Women 
Italian women who arrived during the period of mass immigration had to adapt to new and unfamiliar social and economic conditions. Mothers, who had the task of raising the children and providing for the welfare of the family, commonly demonstrated great courage and resourcefulness in meeting these obligations, often under adverse living conditions. Their cultural traditions, which placed the highest priority on the family, remained strong as Italian immigrant women adapted to these new circumstances. Married women typically avoided factory work and chose home-based economic activities such as dressmaking, taking in boarders, and operating small shops in their homes or neighborhoods. Italian neighborhoods also proved attractive to midwives, women who trained in Italy before coming to America. Many single women were employed in the garment industry as seamstresses, often in unsafe working environments. Many of the 146 who died in the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire in 1911 were Italian-American women. Angela Bambase was an 18-year-old Italian-American organizer for the International Ladies Garment Workers Union in New York who worked to secure better working conditions and shorter hours for women workers in the garment industry. The American scene in the 1920s featured a widespread expansion of women's roles, starting with the vote in 1920, and including new standards of education, employment and control of their own sexuality. Flappers raised the hemline and lowered the old restrictions in women's fashion. The Italian-American media disapproved. It demanded the holding of the line regarding traditional gender roles in which men controlled their families. Many traditional patriarchal values prevailed among Southern European male immigrants, although some practices like dowry were left behind in Europe. The community spokesmen were shocked at the notion of a woman marking her secret ballot. They ridiculed flappers and proclaimed that feminism was immoral. They idealized an old male model of Italian womanhood. Mussolini was popular with readers and subsidized some papers, so when he expanded the electorate to include some women voting at the local level, the Italian-American editorialists applauded him, arguing that the true Italian woman was, above all, a mother and a wife and, therefore, would be reliable as a voter on local matters but only in Italy. Feminist organizations in Italy were ignored, as the editors purposely associated emancipation with Americanism and transformed the debate over women's rights into a defense of the Italian-American community to set its own boundaries and rules. The ethnic papers featured a woman's page that updated readers on the latest fabrics, color combinations, and accessories including hats, shoes, handbags, and jewelry. Food was a major concern, and recipes were presented which adjusted to the availability of ingredients in the American market. Food supplies were limited in Italy by poverty and strict import controls, but abundant in America, so new recipes were needed to take advantage. In the second and third generations, opportunities expanded as women were gradually accepted in the workplace and as entrepreneurs. Women also had much better job opportunities because they had a high school or sometimes college education, and were willing to leave the Little Italys and commute to work. During World War II large numbers of Italian-American women entered the workforce in factories providing war materiel, while others served as auxiliaries or nurses in the military services. After the war, Italian-American women had much greater freedom in choosing a career, and seeking higher levels of education. Consequently, the second half of the 20th century was a period in which Italian-American women excelled in virtually all fields of endeavor. They were responsible for a significant number of firsts. In politics, Geraldine Ferraro was the first woman vice presidential candidate, Ella Grasso was the first woman elected as a state governor and Nancy Pelosi was the first woman Speaker of the House. Mother Angelica Rita Rizzo, a Franciscan nun, in 1980 founded the Eternal Word Television Network EWTN, a network viewed regularly by millions of Catholics. Joanne Folletta was the first woman to become a permanent conductor of a major symphony orchestra with both the Virginia Symphony Orchestra and the Buffalo Philharmonic Orchestra, Penny Marshall was one of the first woman directors in Hollywood, Catherine DeAngelis, M.D. was the first woman editor of the Journal of the American Medical Association, Patricia Philly Crushell was the first woman president of ABC Television, Bonnie Tiberzi was the first woman pilot in commercial aviation history, Patricia Russo was the first woman to become CEO of Lucent Technologies, Karen Ignani has, since 1993, been the CEO of American Health Insurance Plans, an umbrella organization 
organization representing all major HMOs in the country. Nicole Marie Pisonostat was one of the first women to go into space as an astronaut. Carolyn Porco, a world recognized expert in planetary probes, is the leader of the imaging science team for the Cassini probe, presently in orbit around Saturn. The National Organization of Italian American Women, founded in 1980, is an organization for women of Italian heritage committed to preserving Italian heritage, language, and culture by promoting and supporting the advancement of women of Italian ancestry. Culture The culture the Italian immigrants brought with them was generally not the high Italian culture of Dante and Michelangelo, but the culture of the region or village from which they came. These individual but related cultures established the basis of contemporary Italian-American culture. A University of Chicago study of 15 ethnic groups showed that Italian-Americans were among those groups having the lowest percentages of divorce, unemployment, people on welfare and those incarcerated. On the other hand, they were among those groups with the highest percentages of two-parent families, elderly family members still living at home, and families who eat together on a regular basis. Italian-American culture, and transplanted Italian culture, have influenced American culture in a variety of ways, such as, restaurants, foods, coffees and desserts, wine production in California and elsewhere in the U.S., popular music, starting in the 1940s and 1950s, and continuing into the present, operatic, classical and instrumental music, jazz, fashion and design. Capra-esque. Movies in the style of Frank Capra, Italianate architecture, in homes, churches, and public buildings, Montessori schools, Christmas creches, fireworks displays, bocce, Columbus Day parades, and the commemoration of Columbus, as reflected in numerous monuments, city names, names of institutions and the poetic name, Columbia, for the United States itself. The Italian American Museum in New York City, established in 2001, is dedicated to the struggles of the Italian immigrants and their descendants, and to their achievements and contributions to American culture and society. The Italic Institute of America is dedicated to fostering and preserving knowledge of the classical Italian heritage of American society, through the Latin language and Greco-Roman Etruscan civilization, as well as five centuries of contributions to American society by Italians and their descendants. The National Italian American Foundation NIAF, a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization headquartered in Washington, D.C. works to represent Italian Americans, spread knowledge of the Italian language, foster U.S.-Italy relations and connect the greater Italian American community. Additionally, two major Italian American fraternal and service organizations, Order Sons of Italy in America and Unico National, actively promote knowledge of Italian American history and culture. The Italian Heritage and Culture Committee, NY, Inc. was founded in 1976, and has organized special events, concerts, exhibits and lectures celebrating Italian culture in New York City. Each year it focuses on a theme representative of the history and culture of Italy and Italian Americans. Literature <inaudible> 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 The works of a number of early Italian-American authors and poets, born of immigrant parents, were published in the first half of the 20th century. Pietro di Donato, born in 1911, was a writer best known for his novel, Christ in Concrete, which was hailed by critics in the United States and abroad as a metaphor for the immigrant experience in America. Francis Winwar, born Francesca Vinciguerra in 1907 in Sicily, came to the United States at age 10. She is best known for her series of biographies of 19th-century English writers. She was also a frequent translator of classic Italian works into English, and published several romantic novels set during historical events. John Cherty, born in 1916, was primarily a poet. Among his works is a highly respected English-language rendition of Dante's Divine Comedy. John Fanti, born in 1909, was a novelist, short story writer and screenwriter. Later in the century, a growing number of books by recognized Italian-American authors, such as Don DeLillo, Janina Brasci, Paul Gallico, Poseidon Adventure, Gilbert Sorrentino, Gay Talese, Camille Paglia and Mario Puzo The Fortunate Pilgrim found a place in mainstream American literature. 
Other notable 20th century authors included Dana Joya, executive director of the National Endowment for the Arts, John Fusco, author of Paradise Salvage, Tina DeRosa, and Daniela Giuseffi, winner of the John Churdy Award for Lifetime Achievement in Poetry, and the American Book Award, and Josephine Gattuso Hendon. The Right Thing to Do. Poets Sandra Mortola Gilbert and Kim Adonisio were also winners of the John Churdy Award for Lifetime Achievement in Poetry from Italian Americana, as was writer Helen Berellini and poet Maria Mazziotti Gillen. These women have authored many books depicting Italian American women in a new light. Helen Berellini's The Dream Book, an anthology of writings by Italian American women 1985, was the first anthology that pulled together the historic range of writing from the late 19th century to the 1980s. It exhibited the wealth of fiction, poetry, essays, and letters, and paid special attention to the interaction of Italian American women with American social activism. Italian American poets Lawrence Ferlinghetti and Gregory Corso played a prominent role in the Beat Generation. Ferlinghetti was also the co-founder of City Lights Bookstore, a San Francisco bookstore and publishing company that published much of the work of other Beat Generation writers. Many of these authors' books and writings are easily found on the Internet, as for example on an archive of contemporary Italian-American authors, as well as in bibliographies online at Stony Brook University's Italian-American Studies Department in New York, or at the Italian-American Writers Association website. A scholarly literature has also emerged that critiques the literary output. Common themes include conflicts between marginal Italian-American and mainstream culture, and tradition-bound immigrant parents opposed by their more assimilated children. Mary Jo Bona provided the first full-length scholarly analysis of the literary tradition. She is especially interested in showing how authors portrayed the many configurations of family relationships, from the early immigrant narratives of journeying to a new world, through novels that stress intergenerational conflicts, to contemporary works about the struggle of modern women to form nontraditional gender roles. Among the scholars who have led the Renaissance in Italian American literature are professors Richard Gambino, Anthony Julian Tambori, Paolo Giordano, and Fred Gardafe. The latter three founded Bordighera Press and edited From the Margin, an anthology of Italian-American writing, Purdue University Press. At Brooklyn College, Dr. Robert Viscusi founded the Italian-American Writers Association, and is an author and American Book Award winner himself. As a result of the efforts of magazines like Voices in Italian Americana, Ambassador, a publication of the National Italian American Foundation and Italian Americana, edited by Carol Bonomo Albright, Italian Americans have been reading more works of their own writers. A supplemental website at www.italianamericana.com to the journal Italian Americana, edited by novelist Christine Palamadesi Moore, also offers historical articles, stories, memoirs, poetry, and book reviews. Dana Gioia, was poetry editor of Italian Americana from 1993 to 2003, followed by poet Michael Palma, who also selects poems for Italian Americana's webpage supplement. Lawrence Ferlinghetti, Daniela Giuseffi and Paul Mariani, are among the internationally known authors who have been awarded the John Churdy Award for Lifetime Achievement in Poetry during Michael Palma's tenure as poetry editor. Daniela Giuseffi, with Alfredo de Palci, founded the annual $2000 Bordighera Poetry Prize to further the names of Italian-American poets in American literature. As of 1997, 12 books have been published in the bilingual series from Bordighera Press. In the field of academic cinema studies, Peter Bondanella, Peter Brunette, and Frank P. Tomasolo have made significant contributions to film scholarship as authors, editors, and educators. Italian Americans have written not only about the Italian American experience but, indeed, the human experience. Some of the most popular inspirational books have been authored by Italian Americans, notably, those of Ogmandino, Leo Buscaglia and Antoinette Bosco. A series of inspirational books for children has been written by Tami De Paola. Contemporary best-selling fiction writers include David Baldacci, Kate DiCamillo, Richard Russo, Adriana Trigiani and Lisa Scottoline. Religion. The vast majority of Italian Americans are Catholics, at least nominally. 400 Italian Jesuit priests left Italy for the American West between 1848 and 1919. 
Most of these Jesuits left their homeland involuntarily, expelled by Italian nationalists in the successive waves of Italian unification that dominated Italy. When they came to the West, they ministered to Indians in the Northwest, Irish Americans in San Francisco and Mexican Americans in the Southwest, they also ran the nation's most influential Catholic seminary, in Woodstock, M.D. In addition to their pastoral work, they founded numerous high schools and colleges, including Regis University, Santa Clara University, the University of San Francisco, and Gonzaga University. In some Sicilian American communities, primarily Buffalo and New Orleans, St. Joseph's Day March 19 is marked by parades and celebrations, including traditional St. Joseph's Tables, where meatless dishes are served for the benefit of the community's poor. Columbus Day is also widely celebrated, as are the feasts of some regional Italian patron saints. In Boston's North End, the Italian immigrants celebrate the Feast of All Feasts, St. Anthony's Feast. Started by Italian immigrants from Montefalcioni, a small town near Naples, Italy in 1919, the feast is widely considered the largest and most authentic Italian religious festival in the United States. Over 100 vendors and 300,000 people attend the feast over a three-day period in August. San Gennaro September 19, is another popular saint, especially among Neapolitans. Santa Rosalia September 4, is celebrated by immigrants from Sicily. Immigrants from Potenza celebrate the San Rocco's Day August 16 feast at the Potenza Lodge in Denver the third weekend of August. San Rocco is the patron saint of Potenza, as is San Gerardo. Many still celebrate the Christmas season with a Feast of the Seven Fishes. The Feast of the Assumption is celebrated in Cleveland's Little Italy on August 15. On this feast day, people will pin money on a Blessed Virgin Mary statue as a symbol of prosperity. The statue is then paraded through Little Italy to Holy Rosary Church. For almost 25 years, Cleveland Bishop Anthony Pilla participated in the parade and mass to celebrate his Italian heritage. Bishop Pilla retired in April 2006, but continues to participate. While most Italian-American families have a Catholic background, there are converts to Protestantism as well. In the early 20th century, about 300 Protestant missionaries worked in urban Italian-American neighborhoods. Some have joined the Episcopal Church, which still retains much of the Catholic liturgical form. Some have converted to Evangelical churches. Fiorello LaGuardia was an Episcopalian on his father's side, his mother was from the small but significant community of Italian Jews. There is a small charismatic denomination, known as the Christian Church of North America, which is rooted in the Italian Pentecostal movement that originated in Chicago in the early 20th century. A group of Italian immigrants in Trenton, New Jersey and Wakefield, Mass., built their own small Baptist chapel and converted to the Baptist denomination. The Church of Jesus Christ Bickertonite, a denomination of the Latter-day Saint movement, which is headquartered in Monongahela, Pennsylvania, counts significant numbers of Italian Americans in its leadership and membership. The town of Valdez, North Carolina was founded in 1893 by a group of Italians of Waldensian religion, originally from the Cottian Alps in Italy. Italian Jews. The Jewish emigration from Italy was never of a magnitude that resulted in the formation of Italian Jewish communities in the United States. Religious Italian Jews integrated into existing Jewish communities without difficulty, especially in Sephardic communities, and those who were secular found Jewish secular institutions in the United States ready to welcome them. Despite their small numbers, Italian-American Jews have had a great impact on American life, starting with Lorenzo da Ponte born Emanuele Canelliano, Mozart's former librettist, opera impresario and first professor of Italian at Columbia College in New York where he lived from 1805 to his death in 1838. From a religious point of view the figure of greatest influence is that of Rabbi Sabato Morais who, at the end of the 19th century, was the leader of the large Sephardic community of Philadelphia and, in 1886, one of the founders of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America in New York, where he became the first dean. 
Two other Italian Jews achieved prominence in the United States in the first half of the 20th century. Giorgio Polacco was the principal conductor of the Metropolitan Opera House (1915–17) and the Chicago Civic Opera (1921–30), and Fiorello LaGuardia was a member of the U.S. Congress (1917–19 and 1923–33) and a popular mayor of New York (1934–45). A descendant on his mother's side of the great Italian rabbi Samuel David Lozato, LaGuardia could address his constituency in both Italian and Yiddish. Under the Italian racial laws of 1938, Jewish Italians, who had lived in Italy for over two millennia, were denied many civic liberties. Because they were forbidden to teach at Italian universities, some sought refuge in the United States, where they subsequently made significant contributions. Many achieved international importance, including, Guido Fubini, Giorgio Levi della Vita, Mario Castelnuovo Tedesco, Vittorio Rithi, Bruno Rossi, Emilio Segre, Giorgio Cavaglieri, Hugo Fano, Robert Fano, Guido Fubini, Eugene Fubini, and Silvano Arietti. Of particular importance also are the contributions of the Italian Jewish women Maria Bianca Finzi Contini, Bianca Era Artom, and Giuliana Tessero, who opened the fields of university and scientific research to Italian American women. After the war, four Italian American Jews received the Nobel Prize Franco Modigliani, Emilio Segre, Salvador Luria, and Rita Levi Montalcini. Also of significance are the contributions of communication specialist Andrew Viterbi, journalist, writer Ken Aletta and economist Guido Calabresi. The international recognition of the work of Primo Levi and other Italian Jewish authors, such as Giorgio Bassani and Carlo Levi, has increased the interest in the United States in Italian Judaism, as demonstrated by the opening in 1998 of the Primo Levi Center of New York. Education During the era of mass immigration, rural families in Italy did not place a high value on formal education since they needed their children to help with chores as soon as they were old enough. For many, this attitude did not change upon arriving in America, where children were expected to help support the family as soon as possible. This view toward education steadily changed with each successive generation. The 1970 census revealed that those under age 45 had achieved a level of education comparable to the national average, and within six decades of their peak immigration year, Italian Americans as a whole had equaled the national average in educational attainment. Presently, according to Census Bureau data, Italian Americans have an average high school graduation rate, and a higher rate of advanced degrees compared to the national average. Italian Americans throughout the United States are well represented in a wide variety of occupations and professions, from skilled trades, to the arts, to engineering, science, mathematics, law, and medicine, and include a number of Nobel Prize winners. There is one Italian international school in the United States, La Scuola d'Italia Guglielmo Marconi in New York City. Language According to the Sons of Italy News Bureau, from 1998 to 2002 the enrollment in college Italian language courses grew by 30%, faster than the enrollment rates for French and German. Italian is the fourth most commonly taught foreign language in U.S. colleges and universities behind Spanish, French, and German. According to the U.S. 2000 census, Italian including Sicilian is the sixth most spoken language in the United States tied with Vietnamese after English with over one million speakers. As a result of the large wave of Italian immigration to the United States in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Italian and Sicilian were once widely spoken in much of the U.S., especially in northeastern and Great Lakes area cities like Buffalo, Rochester, Detroit, Chicago, Cleveland, and Milwaukee, as well as San Francisco. St. Louis and New Orleans. Italian language newspapers exist in many American cities, especially New York City, and Italian language movie theaters existed in the U.S. as late as the 1950s. Ladea is a bilingual quarterly published in Brooklyn since 1974. Arba Sicula Sicilian Don is a semi-annual publication of the Society of the Same Name, dedicated to preserving the Sicilian language. The magazine and a periodic newsletter offer prose, poetry and comment in Sicilian, with adjacent English translations. 
Today, prizes like the Bordighera Annual Poetry Prize, founded by Daniela Giuseffi, Pietro Mastradria and Alfredo Di Palci, with support from the Sonia Reyes GIOP Foundation and Bordighera Press, which publishes the winners in bilingual editions, have helped to encourage writers of the diaspora to write in Italian. Chelsea Books in New York City and Gradova Press on Long Island have published many bilingual books due to the efforts of bilingual writers of the diaspora like Paolo Valesio, Alfredo De Palci, and Luigi Fontanella. Dr. Luigi Bonafini of the City University of New York, publisher of the Journal of Italian Translation at Brooklyn College, has fostered Italian dialectic poetry throughout Italy and the U.S. Joseph Tusiani of New York and New York University, a distinguished linguist and prize-winning poet born in Italy, paved the way for Italian works of literature in English and has published many bilingual books and Italian classics for the American audience, among them the first complete works of Michelangelo's poems in English to be published in the United States. All of this literary endeavor has helped to foster the Italian language, along with Italian opera, of course, in the United States. Many of these authors and their bilingual books are located throughout the Internet. Author Lawrence De Stasi argues that the loss of spoken Italian among the Italian-American population can be tied to U.S. government pressures during World War II. During World War II, in various parts of the country, the U.S. government displayed signs that read, Don't speak the enemy's language. Such signs designated the languages of the Axis powers, German, Japanese, and Italian, as enemy languages. Shortly after the Axis powers declared war on the U.S., many Italian, Japanese and German citizens were interned. Among the Italian Americans, those who spoke Italian, who had never become citizens, and who belonged to groups that praised Benito Mussolini, were most likely to become candidates for internment. De Stasi claims that many Italian language schools closed down in the San Francisco Bay Area within a week of the U.S. declaration of war on the Axis powers. Such closures were inevitable since most of the teachers in Italian languages were interned. Despite previous decline, Italian and Sicilian are still spoken and studied by those of Italian-American descent, and it can be heard in various American communities, especially among older Italian-Americans. During the late 20th and early 21st centuries, interest in Italian language and culture has surged among Italian Americans. The official Italian that is taught in colleges and universities is an amalgam of the Tuscan and Roman dialects. It is generally not the Italian with which Italian Americans are generally acquainted. Because the languages spoken by Italian Americans come from a time just after the unification of Italy, their languages are in many ways archaic and resemble the southern Italian and Sicilian dialects of pre-unification Italy. These variations, though still spoken along with standard Italian Tuscan, Roman, have also evolved in minor ways. Despite it being the fifth most studied language in higher education college and graduate settings throughout America, the Italian language has struggled to maintain being an AP course of study in high schools nationwide. It was only in 2006 that AP Italian classes were first introduced, and they were soon dropped from the national curricula after the spring of 2009. The organization which manages such curricula, the College Board, ended the AP Italian program because it was losing money and had failed to add 5,000 new students each year. Since the program's termination in the spring of 2009, various Italian organizations and activists have attempted to revive the course of study. Most notable in the effort is Margaret Cuomo, sister of New York Governor Andrew Cuomo. She provided the impetus for the program's birth in 2006 and is currently attempting to secure funding and teachers to reinstate the program. It is also worth noting that Italian organizations have begun fundraisers to revive AP Italian. Organizations such as the NIAF and Order Sons of Italy in America have made strides in collecting money, and are prepared to aid in the monetary responsibility any new AP Italian program would bring with it. Moreover, web-based Italian organizations, such as Italianaware, have begun book donation campaigns to improve the status and representation of Italian and Italian-American literature in the New York public libraries. According to Italianaware, the Brooklyn Public Library is the worst offender in New York City. It has 11 books pertaining to the Italian immigrant experience available for checkout spread across 60 branches. That amounts to one book for every six branches in Brooklyn, which according to Italianaware cannot supply the large Italian, Italian-American community in the borough. Italianaware aims to donate 100 books to the Brooklyn Public Library by the end of 2010.
Topic: Newspapers. Generoso Pope (1891–1950), the owner of a chain of Italian language newspapers in major cities, stands out as the epitome of the Italian American ethnic political broker. He bought Il Progresso Italo Americano in 1928 for two million dollars. He doubled its circulation to 200,000 in New York City, making it the largest Italian language paper in the country. He purchased additional papers in New York and Philadelphia, which became the chief source of political, social, and cultural information for the community. Pope encouraged his readers to learn English, become citizens, and vote. His goal was to instill pride and ambition to succeed in modern America. A conservative Democrat who ran the Columbus Day Parade and admired Mussolini, Pope was the most powerful enemy of anti fascism among Italian Americans. Closely associated with Tammany Hall politics in New York, Pope and his newspapers played a vital role in securing the Italian vote for Franklin D. Roosevelt's Democratic tickets. He served as chairman of the Italian division of the Democratic National Committee in 1936, and helped persuade the president to take a neutral attitude over Italy's invasion of Ethiopia. He broke with Mussolini in 1941 and enthusiastically supported the American war effort. In the late 1940s Pope supported the election of William O'Dwyer as mayor in 1945 and Harry S. Truman as president. His business concerns continued to prosper under New York's Democratic administrations, and in 1946 he added the Italian-language radio station Whom to his media holdings. In the early years of the Cold War, Pope was a leading anti-communist and orchestrated a letter-writing campaign by his subscribers to stop the communists from winning the Italian elections in 1948. Voters did not always vote the way editorials dictated, but they depended on the news coverage. At many smaller papers, support for Mussolini, short-sighted opportunism, deference to political patrons who were not members of the Italian-American communities, and the necessity of making a living through periodicals with a small circulation, generally weakened the owners of Italian-language newspapers when they tried to become political brokers of the Italian-American vote. James V. Donnarumma purchased Boston's La Gazzetta del Massachusetts in 1905. La Gazzetta enjoyed a wide readership in Boston's Italian community because it emphasized detailed coverage of local ethnic events and explained how events in Europe affected the community. Donnarumma's editorial positions, however, were frequently at odds with the sentiments of his readership. Donnarumma's conservative views and desire for greater advertising revenue prompted him to court the favor of Boston's Republican elite, to whom he pledged editorial support in return for the purchase of advertising space for political campaigns. La Gazzetta consistently supported Republican candidates and policy positions, even when the party was proposing and passing laws to restrict Italian immigration. Nevertheless, voting records from the 1920s to 1930s show that Boston's Italian Americans voted heavily for Democratic candidates. Carmelo Zito took over the San Francisco newspaper Il Corriere del Popolo in 1935. Under Zito, it became one of the fiercest foes of Mussolini's fascism on the West Coast. It vigorously attacked Italy's 1935 invasion of Ethiopia and its intervention in the Spanish Civil War. Zito helped form the Italian-American Anti-Fascist League and often attacked certain Italian prominenti like Ettore Patrizzi, publisher of L'Italia and La Voce del Popolo. Zito's paper campaigned against alleged Italian pro-fascist language schools of San Francisco. In 1909, Vincenzo Giuliano, an immigrant from Calabria, Italy, and his wife Maria Oliva founded La Tribune Italiana d'America, known today as the Italian Tribune, which circulates throughout southeastern Michigan. A second newspaper founded by a Catholic order of priests, La Voce del Popolo also served the Metro Detroit community until the 1920s, when that newspaper merged with La Tribuna Italiana d'America. Upon Giuliano's death in the 1960s, his family continued the paper. Topic: <inaudible> Folklore. The most characteristic and popular of Italian American cultural contributions has been their feasts. Throughout the United States, wherever one may find an Italian neighborhood, often referred to as Little Italy, one can find festive celebrations such as the well-known Feast of San Gennaro in New York City, the unique Our Lady of Mount Carmel, Giglio, feast in the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn, New York. Italian feasts involve elaborate displays of devotion to Jesus Christ and patron saints. 
On the weekend of the last Sunday in August, the residents of Boston's North End celebrate the Feast of All Feasts in honor of St. Anthony of Padua, which was started over 300 years ago in Montefalcione, Italy. Perhaps the most widely known is St. Joseph's Feast Day on March 19. These feasts are much more than simply isolated events within the year. Feast festa in Italian is an umbrella term for the various secular and religious, indoor and outdoor activities surrounding a religious holiday. Typically, Italian feasts consist of festive communal meals, religious services, games of chance and skill and elaborate outdoor processions consisting of statues resplendent in jewels and donations. The celebration usually takes place over the course of several days, and is communally prepared by a church community or a religious organization over the course of several months. Currently, there are more than 300 Italian feasts celebrated throughout the United States. The largest is Festa Italiana, held in Milwaukee every summer. These feasts are visited each year by millions of Americans from various backgrounds who come together to enjoy Italian music and food delicacies. In the past, as to this day, an important part of Italian-American culture centers around music and cuisine. Topic: <laughs> Discrimination and stereotyping. During the period of mass immigration to the United States, Italians suffered widespread discrimination in housing and employment. They were often victims of prejudice, economic exploitation, and sometimes even violence, particularly in the South. Beginning in the late 1880s, anti-ethnic sentiment increased, and Roman Catholic churches were often vandalized and burned and Italians were attacked by mobs. In the 1890s, it is estimated that more than 20 Italians were lynched. Much of the anti Italian hostility in the United States was directed at Southern Italians and Sicilians, who began immigrating to the United States in large numbers after 1880. Before that, there were relatively few Italians in North America. Italian stereotypes abounded as a means of justifying the maltreatment of the immigrants. The print media greatly contributed to the stereotyping of Italians with lurid accounts of secret societies and criminality. Between 1890 and 1920, Italian neighborhoods were often depicted as violent and controlled by criminal networks. Two highly publicized cases illustrate the impact of these negative stereotypes. In 1891, 11 Italian immigrants in New Orleans were lynched due to their alleged role in the murder of the police chief David Hennessy. This was one of the largest mass lynchings in U.S. history. The lynching took place after nine of the immigrants were tried for the murder and acquitted. Subsequently, a mob broke into the jail where they were being held and dragged them out to be lynched, together with two other Italians who were being held in the jail at the time, but had not been accused in the killing. In 1920, two Italian immigrants, Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti, were tried for robbery and murder in Braintree, Massachusetts. Many historians agree that they were given a very unfair and biased trial because of their anarchistic political beliefs and their Italian immigrant status. In spite of worldwide protests, Sacco and Vanzetti were eventually executed. While the vast majority of Italian immigrants brought with them a tradition of hard work and were law-abiding citizens, as documented by police statistics of the early 20th century in Boston and New York City which show that Italian immigrants had an arrest rate no greater than that of other major immigrant groups, a very small minority brought a very different custom. This criminal element preyed on the immigrants of the Little Italys, using intimidation and threats to extract protection money from the wealthier immigrants and shop owners, and were also involved in a multitude of other illegal activities. When the fascists came to power in Italy, they made the destruction of the mafia in Sicily a high priority. Hundreds fled to America in the 1920s and 1930s to avoid prosecution. Prohibition, which went into effect in 1920, proved to be an economic windfall for those in the Italian-American community already involved in illegal activities, and those who had fled from Sicily. This entailed smuggling liquor into the country, wholesaling it, and then selling it through a network of outlets. While other ethnic groups were also deeply involved in these illegal ventures, and the associated violence, Chicago mobster Al Capone became the most notorious figure of the Prohibition era. Though eventually repealed, prohibition had a long-term effect as the spawning ground for later criminal activities. In the 1950s, the scope of Italian-American organized crime became well known though a number of highly publicized congressional hearings that followed a police raid on a top-level meeting of racketeers in Appalachian, New York. 
With advanced surveillance techniques, the Witness Protection Program, the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, and vigorous and sustained prosecution the power and influence of organized crime were greatly diminished in the decades that followed. Two Italian-American prosecutors, Rudy Giuliani and Louis Free, were instrumental in bringing this about. Free was later appointed director of the FBI, while Giuliani would serve two terms as mayor of New York City. From the earliest days of the movie industry, Italians have been portrayed as violent criminals and sociopaths. This trend has continued to the present day. The stereotype of Italian Americans is the standardized mental image which has been fostered by the entertainment industry, especially through commercially successful movies like The Godfather, Goodfellas and Casino, and TV programs such as The Sopranos. This follows a known pattern in which it is possible for the mass media to effectively create universally recognized, and sometimes accepted, stereotypes. A highly publicized protest from the Italian American community came in 2001 when the Chicago based organization IDA American Italian Defamation Association unsuccessfully sued Time Warner for distribution of HBO's series The Sopranos because of its negative portrayal of Italian Americans. The DreamWorks animated film, Shark Tale, was widely protested by virtually all major Italian-American organizations as introducing the mob genre and negative stereotyping into a children's movie. In spite of the protests, which started during its early production, the movie was produced and released in 2004. In 2009, MTV launched a reality show, Jersey Shore, which prompted severe criticism from Italian-American organizations such as the National Italian-American Foundation, Order Sons of Italy in America, and Unico National for its stereotypical portrayal of Italian-Americans. The effective stereotyping of Italian Americans as being associated with organized crime was shown by a comprehensive study of Italian American culture on film, conducted from 1996 to 2001 by the Italic Institute of America. The findings showed that over two-thirds of the more than 2,000 films studied portray Italian Americans in a negative light. Further, close to 300 movies featuring Italian Americans as criminals have been produced since The Godfather, an average of nine per year. According to the Italic Institute of America, the mass media has consistently ignored five centuries of Italian-American history, and has elevated what was never more than a minute subculture to the dominant Italian-American culture. In actuality, according to recent FBI statistics, Italian-American organized crime members and associates number approximately 3,000, and, given an Italian-American population estimated to be approximately 18 million, the study concludes that only one in 6,000 has any involvement with organized crime. Topic. Communities Little Italy's were, to a considerable extent, the result of Italophobia. The ethnocentrism and anti-Catholicism exhibited by the earlier Anglo-Saxon and Northern European settlers helped to create an ideological foundation for fixing foreignness on urban spaces occupied by immigrants. Communities of Italian Americans were established in most major industrial cities of the early 20th century, such as Baltimore, Maryland, New York City, New York, Newark, New Jersey, Boston, Massachusetts, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Hartford, Connecticut, Providence, Rhode Island, St. Louis, Missouri, Chicago, Illinois, Cleveland, Ohio, Buffalo, New York, and Kansas City, Missouri. New Orleans, Louisiana was the first site of immigration of Italians and Sicilians into America in the 19th century, before Italy was a unified nation-state. This was before New York Harbor and Baltimore became the preferred destinations for Italian immigrants. In sharp contrast to the Northeast, most of the southern states with the exception of Central and South Florida and the New Orleans area have relatively few Italian-American residents. During the labor shortage in the 19th and early 20th centuries, planters in the Deep South did attract some Italian immigrants to work as sharecroppers, but they soon left the extreme anti-Italian discrimination and strict regimen of the rural areas for the cities or other states. The state of California has had Italian-American residents since the 1850s. By the 1970s gentrification of inner-city neighborhoods and the arrival of new immigrant groups caused a sharp decline in the old Italian-American and other ethnic enclaves. Many Italian-Americans moved to the rapidly growing western states, including Arizona, Colorado, Nevada, and California. 
Today, New York and New Jersey have the largest numbers of Italian Americans in the U.S. while smaller northeastern cities such as Pittsburgh, Providence and Hartford have the highest percentage of Italian Americans in their metropolitan areas. New York City Several Little Italys exist in New York City, including Manhattan, Belmont, Bensonhurst, Howard Beach and Rosebank. Historically, Little Italy on Mulberry Street in Manhattan, extends as far south as Canal Street, as far north as Bleecker, as far west as Lafayette and as far east as the Bowery. The neighborhood was once known for its large population of Italians. Today it consists of Italian stores and restaurants. The Italian immigrants congregated along Mulberry Street in Manhattan's Little Italy to celebrate San Gennaro as the patron saint of Naples. The Feast of San Gennaro is a large street fair, lasting 11 days, that takes place every September along Mulberry Street between Houston and Canal Streets. The festival is as an annual celebration of Italian culture and the Italian-American community. Today, much of the neighborhood has been absorbed and engulfed by Chinatown, as immigrants from China moved to the area. Arthur Avenue in the Belmont section of New York City's northernmost borough, the Bronx, was once the heart of the Bronx's Little Italy. Robert De Niro's directing debut, A Bronx Tale, takes place within Little Italy, however, it was largely filmed in Astoria, Queens. The series' third watch was initially based on Arthur Avenue, with the first episode referring to the firehouse as Camelot, based on its location at the intersection of King Street and Arthur Avenue. The 1973 film The Seven Ups, starring Roy Scheider, was filmed on Arthur Avenue and Hoffman Street. In 2003, a scene from the HBO series The Sopranos was shot in Mario's restaurant. Leonard, of James Fry's A Million Little Pieces, grew up in this area. Much of the novel Underworld takes place near Arthur Avenue. The author, Don DeLillo, himself grew up in that neighborhood. Bensonhurst is heavily Italian-American, and it is usually considered the main Little Italy of Brooklyn. The Italian-speaking community remains over 20,000 strong, according to the census of 2000. However, the Italian-speaking community is becoming increasingly elderly and isolated, with the small, tight-knit enclaves they built around the city slowly disappearing as they give way to demographic changes. Its main thoroughfare, 18th Avenue also known as Cristoforo Colombo Boulevard between roughly 60th Street and Shore Parkway, is lined with predominantly small, Italian family-owned businesses—many of which have remained in the same family for several generations. 86th Street is another popular local thoroughfare, lined by the arches of the elevated BMT West End subway line. The 18th Avenue station was popularized in opening credits of Welcome Back, Cotter. Rosebank in Staten Island was another one of NYC's main area of Italian immigrants since the 1880s, and their descendants have continued as its predominant ethnic group, exemplified by the location of the Garibaldi Memorial in the community. In recent years the town has experienced an influx of other ethnic groups, including Eastern Europeans, various Latin nationalities as well as Asians, particularly from the Philippines. Howard Beach in the Queens is also home to a large Italian population. Topic. Philadelphia Philadelphia's Italian American community is the second largest in the United States. Italian Americans compose 21% of South Philadelphia's 163,000 people, and the area has numerous Italian stores and restaurants. Philadelphia is well known for its Italian market in South Philadelphia. The Italian market is the popular name for the South 9th Street Curb Market, an area of Philadelphia featuring many grocery shops, cafes, restaurants, bakeries, cheese shops, and butcher shops, many with an Italian influence. The historical heart of the market is the area of 9th Street between Christian Street and Washington Avenue, and is now generally considered to extend from Fitzwater Street at the north to Wharton Street at the south. The term Italian market is also used to describe the surrounding neighborhood between South Street to the north and Wharton Street to the south running a few blocks to the east and west of 9th Street. It is entirely contained in the Bella Vista neighborhood. The outdoor market features bright, colorful metal awnings that cover the sidewalks where vendors of fruit, vegetables, fish, and housewares conduct business year-round. Ground floor shops in traditional Philadelphia rowhouses line the street. 
Owners would have originally lived above their shops, and many still do. The market has also played a role in the culture of Philadelphia, and is often included in cultural depictions of the city. For example, the Italian market was featured in the Rocky films, most notably the running, training montage where a vendor tosses the boxer an orange in Rocky. The television series Hack also filmed several episodes that featured the Italian market. The Italian market was also featured on a season 5 episode of the television show It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Philadelphia has played a large role in Italian-American cooking, featuring numerous cheesesteak shacks such as Pat's and Gino's throughout the city and suburbs. Italian Philadelphians have strongly influenced the creation of Philadelphia's brand of cuisine with cheesesteak sandwiches, hoagies, Italian ices, Philly-style soft pretzels, stromboli and bakery-styled tomato pies. South Philadelphia has produced many well-known Italian-American popular singers and musicians, including Tony Matola, famous for the Tony Matola or Danger Chord, Frankie Avalon, Bobby Riddle, Mario Lanza, Al Martino, Jim Croce, Fabian Forte, Joey DeFrancesco, Buddy DeFranco, Fred Diodati, lead singer of the Four Aces, Buddy Greco, Charlie Ventura, Eddie Lang, Joe Venuti, Mark Valentino, and Vinnie Paz, Vincent, Jimmy Saunders, La Spada. Boston The North End in Boston since the early 20th century became the center of the Italian community of Boston. It is still largely residential and well known for its small, authentic Italian restaurants and for the first Italian café, Café Vittoria. The influx of Italian inhabitants has left a lasting mark on the area, many seminal Italian-American. Prince Pasta was begun by three Sicilian immigrants Gaetano Lamarco, Giuseppe Seminara, and Michelle Cantella. Pastini was formed by Sicilian immigrant Luigi Pastini. Both companies have grown into million-dollar-a-year businesses, and continue to be successful to the present day. To fully understand the sheer size of the Italian immigrant population, one must look back at the groups that preceded them. The Irish, at their peak, numbered roughly 14,000 and the Jews numbered 17,000. The Italians, however, peaked at over 44,000. <inaudible> Newark In its heyday, 7th Avenue in Newark was one of the largest Little Italys in the U.S. with a population of 30,000, in an area of less than a square mile. The center of life in the neighborhood was St. Lucis Church, founded by Italian immigrants in 1891. Throughout the year, St. Lucis and other churches sponsored processions in honor of saints that became community events. The most famous procession was the Feast of St. Gerard, but there were also great feasts for Our Lady of Mount Carmel, Our Lady of Snow, the Assumption, and St. Rocco. Joe DiMaggio loved the restaurants of 7th Avenue so much that he would take the New York Yankees to Newark to show them real Italian food. Frank Sinatra had bread from Giordano's bakery sent to him every week until his death, no matter where in the world he was. New York Yankees catcher Rick Cironi also grew up in the First Ward. One of the nation's largest Italian newspapers, the Italian Tribune, was founded on 7th Avenue. 7th Avenue produced stars such as Joe Pesci and Frankie Valli of the Four Seasons. Congressman Peter Rodino, chairman of the House Judiciary Committee during its impeachment proceedings against Richard Nixon was a native of the First Ward as well. Seventh Avenue was notoriously devastated by urban renewal efforts during the 1950s. Eighth Avenue was obliterated by the city council, scattering the Italian-American residents. Most of its businesses never recovered. The construction of Interstate 280 also served to cut the neighborhood off from the rest of the city. After the devastating urban renewal, some of the First Ward's Italians stayed in the neighborhood, while others migrated to other Newark neighborhoods like Broadway, Roseville, and the Ironbound, or other parts of New Jersey. St. <laughs> Louis <laughs> Syracuse Italian immigrants first came to the area around Syracuse, New York a city named for Syracusa, Sicily in 1883 after providing labor for the construction of the West Shore Railroad. At first, they were quite transient and came and went, but eventually settled down on the north side. 
By 1899, the Italian immigrants were living on the north side of the city in the area centered around Pearl Street. The Italians all but supplanted the Germans in that area of the city and had their own business district along North State and North Salina Streets. By September 2009, Syracuse's Little Italy district received millions of dollars of public and private investment for new sidewalks, streetscapes, landscaping, lighting and to set up a green train program, which trains men to work in green construction and renovation industries. In recent years, the neighborhood is a mix of Italian shops, restaurants and businesses that cater to the area's South Asian and African population. Although the neighborhood is far less Italian than in past years, banners throughout the district still read Little Italy. By 2010, demographics showed that 14.1% of the population in Syracuse was Italian descent. Providence Federal Hill in Providence, Rhode Island, is best known for its Italian-American community and abundance of restaurants. The first two decades of the 20th century witnessed heavy Italian-American immigration into Federal Hill, making it the city's informal Little Italy. Though the area today is more diverse, Federal Hill still retains its status as the traditional center for the city's Italian-American community. The neighborhood features a huge square dedicated to Giuseppe Garibaldi, a monumental gateway arch decorated with La Pigna sculpture a traditional Italian symbol of welcome, abundance, and quality and a Di Pasquale plaza used for outdoor dining. Providence's annual Columbus Day Parade marches down Atwell's Avenue. <laughs> Chicago The neighborhood around Chicago's Taylor Street has been called the port of call for Chicago's Italian-American immigrants. Taylor Street's Little Italy was home to Hull House, an early settlement house, founded by Jane Addams and Ellen Starr in 1889. Chicago's Italian-American experience begins with the mass migration from the shores of southern Italy, the Hull House experiment, the Great Depression, World War II, and the machinations behind the physical demise of a neighborhood by the University of Illinois in 1963. Italian Americans dominated the inner core of the Hull House neighborhood, 1890s to 1930s. One of the first newspaper articles about Hull House Chicago Tribune, May 19, 1890 is an invitation, written in Italian, to the residents of the Hull House neighborhood signed, La Signorine, Jane Addams and Ellen Starr. The 1924 historic picture, Meet the Hull House Kids, was taken by Wallace K. Kirkland Sr., one of the Hull House directors. It served as a poster for Jane Addams and the Hull House Settlement House. All 20 kids were first-generation Italian-Americans. All with vowels at the end of their names. They grew up to be lawyers and mechanics, sewer workers and dump truck drivers, a candy shop owner, a boxer and a mob boss. As suburbs grew in the post-World War II era, Chicago's Italian-American population spread from the central city. Chicago's northwest side and the neighboring village of Elmwood Park has the highest concentration of Italian Americans in the state. Harlem Avenue, La Casa Italia, is lined with Italian stores, bakeries, clubs and organizations. The Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel Indiana nearby Melrose Park, has been a regular event in the area for more than 100 years. The near west suburbs of Melrose Park, Schiller Park, Franklin Park, River Grove, Norwich, Chicago Heights, and Harwood Heights are also home to many Italian Americans. West Suburban Stone Park is home of Casa Italia, an Italian American cultural center. The far northwestern suburb of Rockford has a large population of Italian Americans. Cleveland Cleveland's Little Italy, also known as Murray Hill, is the epicenter of Italian culture in Northeast Ohio, a combined statistical area reporting 285,000 .9 Italian Americans. Little Italy took root when Joseph Carabelli, immigrating in 1880, saw the opportunity for monument work in Cleveland's Lake View Cemetery and established what soon became the city's leading marble and granite works. Most fresco and mosaic work in Cleveland was accomplished by Italian artist immigrants. 
Local Cleveland industrial billionaire John D. Rockefeller took a special liking to the Italian immigrants of the neighborhood and commissioned the building of the community center Alta House, named after his daughter Alta Rockefeller Prentice, in 1900. In 1906, Italian immigrant Angelo Vitantonio invented the first hand crank pasta machine, which made pasta much easier to produce by eliminating the need to flatten and cut it by hand. Some other famous Italian Americans from Northeast Ohio included Anthony J. Celebres, 49th mayor of Cleveland, Ettore Hector Boyardi, Chef Boyardi, Frank Battisti, federal judge, and Dean Martin, born Dino Paul Crosetti in Steubenville, Ohio. Ohio's largest outdoor Italian American street festival, the Feast of the Assumption, takes place the weekend of August 15 every year and draws over 100,000 people to the Little Italy neighborhood. The festival is sponsored by the Congregation of Holy Rosary Church, which was founded in 1892 with the current church built in 1905. <laughs> Milwaukee Italians first came to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in the late 19th century. Then in the 19th and 20th centuries large numbers of Italian immigrants began to come in mainly from Sicily and southern Italy. Brady Street, the historic Third Ward and the east side of Milwaukee is considered the heart of Italian immigration to the city, where as many as 20 Italian grocery stores once existed on Brady Street alone. Every year the largest Italian-American festival in the United States, Festa Italiana, takes place in Milwaukee. Italian Americans number at around 16,992 in the city, but in Milwaukee County they number at 38,286. There is also an Italian newspaper called the Italian Times printed by the Italian Community Center ICC. Ybor City The community of Ybor City in Tampa, Florida is a cigar-centric company town founded in 1885 and originally populated by a unique mix of Spanish, Cuban, Jewish, and Italian immigrants, with most of the Italians coming from a small group of villages in southwestern Sicily. At first, Italians found it difficult to find employment in the insular and guild-like cigar industry, which had moved to Tampa from Cuba and Key West and was dominated by Hispanic workers. Many founded businesses to serve cigar workers, most notably small grocery stores in the neighborhood's commercial district supplied by Italian-owned vegetable and dairy farms located on open land east of Tampa's city limits. The immigrant cultures in town became better integrated as time went by. Eventually, approximately 20% of the workers in the cigar industry were Italian Americans. The tradition of local Italian-owned groceries continued, however, and a handful of such businesses founded in the late 1800s were still operating into the 21st century. Many descendants of Sicilian immigrants eventually became prominent local citizens, such as mayors Nick Nuccio and Dick Greco. <laughs> Birmingham Birmingham, Alabama, was representative of smaller industrial centers. Most Italians in the early 20th century came to work in the burgeoning iron and coal industries. Dorothy L. Krim founded the Ensley Community House in the Italian district in 1912 at the behest of the Birmingham City Mission Board. From 1912 to 1969, Ensley House eased the often difficult transition to American life by providing direct assistance such as youth programs and day care services, social clubs, and Americanization programs. <laughs> San Francisco According to the 1940 census, 18.5% of all European immigrants were Italian, the largest in the city. North Beach is San Francisco's Little Italy, and has historically been home to a large Italian-American population. The American Planning Association has named North Beach as one of ten great neighborhoods in America. Los Angeles. Los Angeles is home to the largest Italian-American community in California and the West Coast, with 95,300 people identifying as Italian-American. Unlike other cities with sizable Italian-American communities, Los Angeles does not have a Little Italy. 
The neighborhood with the highest number of Italians is San Pedro, California, which is estimated to contain 45,000 Italian Americans. Most worked as fishermen during the first half of the 20th century. The traditional center of Los Angeles' Little Italy, was the area north of the historic Los Angeles Plaza. It survived somewhat intact until the construction of Los Angeles Union Station, in 1939. The station was built in the center of Los Angeles' old Chinatown. Half of the total Chinese community was displaced by the construction. The Chinese were allowed to relocate to Little Italy, where they quickly took it over. Only a few relic businesses survive, such as San Antonio Winery the only winery, out of 92, to Suvive Prohibition. The Italian American Museum of Los Angeles opened in 2016 in the historic Italian Hall. San Diego Historically, Little Italy in San Diego was the home to Italian fishermen and their families. Many Italians moved to San Diego from San Francisco after the 1906 San Francisco earthquake in search of tuna and other deep-sea sport and commercial fish. When Interstate 5 was constructed through Little Italy in the early 1970s, 35% of the neighborhood was destroyed and during the same time the California tuna industry was declining, which caused the neighborhood to suffer nearly 30 years of decline. With the creation of the Little Italy Association in 1996, the neighborhood has gone through gentrification and has seen a renaissance as community benefit district specializing in Italian food, boutique shopping and maintenance that makes this shopping district the place to live in downtown San Diego. Prior to gentrification, the neighborhood was mainly composed of low-density commercial businesses and single-family detached homes. Currently, the neighborhood is mainly composed of residential units, mostly mid-rises, high-rises, and lofts, with ground-floor retail stores and a few commercial buildings. Demographics In the 2000 U.S. Census, Italian Americans constituted the fifth largest ancestry group in America with about 15.6 million people, 5.6% of the total U.S. population. Sicilian Americans are a subset of numerous Americans of regional Italian ancestries. As of 2006, the U.S. Census estimated the Italian American population at 17.8 million persons, or 6% of the population, constituting a 14% increase over the six-year period. U.S. states number and percentage Italian American in 2010 Alabama 81,587 1.7% Alaska 23,633 3.3% Arizona 281,944 4.4% Arkansas 45,836 1.6% California 1,496,669 4.0% Utah 263,456 5.1% Connecticut 670,030 18.7% Delaware 89,845 9.9% Florida 1,183,957 6.2% Utah 215,321 2.2% Hawaii 28,490 2.1% Idaho 50,497 3.2% Illinois 800,779 6.2% Indiana 173,396 2.7% Iowa 65,528 2.1% Kansas 65,619 2.3% Kentucky 195,561 2.0% Louisiana 219,606 4.8% Maine 74,704 5.6% Maryland 306,074 5.2% Massachusetts 915,687 13.9% Michigan 466,461 4.7% Minnesota 249,178 2.3% Wyoming 
Mississippi 52,235 1.8% Missouri 206,984 3.4% Montana 34,971 3.5% Nebraska 51,299 2.8% Nevada 172,633 6.3% 6 New Hampshire 135,450 10.3% New Jersey 1,487,161 16.8% Maine 49,803 2.4% New York 2,636,152 13.5% North Carolina 287,101 3.0% North Dakota 7,949 1.2% Ohio 744,277 6.4% Oklahoma 64,694 1.7% Oregon 146,120 3.8% Pennsylvania 1,550,850 12.2% Rhode Island 198,721 18.9% South Carolina 135,422 2.9% South Dakota 11,520 1.4% Tennessee 139,333 2.2% Texas 480,716 1.9% Utah 75,513 2.7% Vermont 46,549 7.4% Virginia 322,298 4.0% Washington 245,696 3.6% West Virginia 87,213, 4.7%. Wisconsin 202,490, 3.5%. Wyoming 17,697, 3.1%. District of Columbia 20,531, 3.3%. U.S. states with over 10% people of Italian ancestry Rhode Island 18.9% Connecticut 18.7% New Jersey 16.8% Massachusetts 13.9% New York 13.5% Pennsylvania 12.2% New Hampshire 10.7% U.S. communities with the most residents of Italian ancestry The top 25 U.S. communities with the highest percentage of people claiming Italian ancestry are Johnston, Rhode Island 46.7% Monroe, Massachusetts 46.5% Hamilton, New Jersey 45.9% Frankfurt, New York, Village, 44.7%. East Haven, Connecticut, 43.1%. Rosetto, Pennsylvania, 41.8%. Old Forge, Pennsylvania, 41.3%. Franklin Square, New York, 40.0%. North Massapequa, New York, 38.9%. Frankfurt, New York, 38.5%. Totowa, New Jersey 37.7% Lowellville, Ohio 37.4% Fairfield, New Jersey 37.2% North Providence, Rhode Island 36.6% Thornwood, New York 36.5% South Hackensack, New Jersey 36.3% Hawthorne, New York 36.2% Saugus, Massachusetts 36.1% Nutley, New Jersey 36.0% Jessup, Pennsylvania 35.9% Stoneham, Massachusetts 35.8% Revere, Massachusetts greatest percentage of any city 35.7% 
East Hanover, New Jersey 35.6% Harrison, New York 34.9% Deer Park, New York 34.9% Staten Island, New York, greatest percentage of any county, 34.7%. West Patterson, New Jersey, 34.3%. Valhalla, New York, 34.2%. Lyndhurst, New Jersey, 33.8%. Topic: Notable people. Topic. See also Sicilian Americans Italophilia Anti-Italianism Immigration to the United States Pietro Cesare Alberti Taliaferro Valdez, North Carolina Tontatown, Arkansas Italian American cuisine Italian diaspora Italy USA Foundation Padrone system Utah Italians March 14, 1891 lynchings Topic. References and notes Topic. Bibliography Topic. External links La Gazzetta Italiana, the Italian American Voice, Italian American Digital Project, National Italian American Foundation, Italian American Websites at the Open Directory Project, Immigration to Italian Library of Congress, Italian Immigration Digital History, University of Houston Italian American Museum, New York Italy Revisited Photo Archives Taylor Street Archives ItalianImmigrants.org 1855-1900 Italian Heritage and Culture Committee of New York, Inc. Italian. Chicago Foreign Language Press Survey. Chicago Public Library Omnibus Project of the Works Progress Administration of Illinois. 1942 via Newberry Library, selected short newspaper articles, translated into English, 1855-1938.